Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Okay, so it's a pleasure to have uh, Samuel Ranelucci speaking today. Uh, Samuel is a student at uh, University of Montreal. Um, and he's done uh, some work on multiparty computation. And I guess today he'll be talking about uh, oblivious transfer. Uh, so my name is Samuel Ranalucci, and today I will talk, be talking to you about a primitive called generalized oblivious transfer. And then I'll show a couple of applications of generalized oblivious transfer. So first of all, I'm going to talk about a couple of primitives. First of all, there are going to be building blocks for, for understanding and, you, and creating our protocols. The first one is oblivious transfer. So we have a sender who has two messages, and the receiver gets to learn one of the two messages, but he should have no information about the other message, and the sender should not know, uh, any, should not know any information about the choice of, receiver, of which message the receiver uh, received. Uh, another important uh, building block is bit commitment. It, it, it's a functionality where the sender commits to a value where he chooses a message and then uh, the receiver receives some confirmation that in fact uh, the sender is committed to a value. And then later uh, the sender uh, reveals the value and the receiver is assured that it's the value that the sender originally chose. And uh, an easy way to think of this is with an actual physical protocol where you take a message and put it in a lockbox and then give the lockbox to the other person. And uh, uh, you can't change the message because he has the lockbox. And uh, if he wants to, the only way he can open the message or get the message is if you give him the combination. Uh, an important primitive that we're going to be using is going to be called verifiable oblivious transfer. And it's kind of a combination of a oblivious transfer and commitment. So it's, it's very much like an oblivious transfer, but, uh, but also uh, the sender is committed to his input. And lay, at a later time, you're able to reveal the values that, you sent, that the, the sender can reveal later what values he sent, and then you'll be assured that those are the values he sent. Um, so VOT is not a very commonly used primitive. So uh, two ways you can implement this are in their information theoretic setting, you can erase your channels to more or less implement it uh, as it is. And we're going to be using, we can use that to implement generalized oblivious transfer later. Um, in the computational setting, what we can do is, if we look at how OT is implemented, usually it's, it's very much that to implement OT, first the sender commits to two messages. And then the receiver uh, creates a ciphertext which allows him, if decrypted, to learn one of the two messages. And, uh, and then the sender decrypts that, that uh, ciphertext, allowing the receiver to learn one of those two messages. If we look at that OT paradigm in the computational setting, well, it would seem very evident to make it verifiable oblivious transfer by simply revealing the, the value of the original ciphertext. Of course, proving its security is another thing. So another important thing that we're going to need to know about is what an access structure. So an access structure is, uh, well, first we have a set of indices. And an access structure is where you take certain set from the power set and you call, call those sets uh, authorized sets. And it's important that if you take an authorized set and you add elements to it, then, then it's also an authorized set. Um, and a very important notion, uh, the, the complement of an access structure is, uh, well, for each element, of the access structure, you, you can take its complement. And uh, the complement of the access structure is just the, uh, the set of all those sets. Um, so 
maybe that takes a further, requires further ex explanation. So first we have a set I, which is one, two, three. And then we have an access structure, which is uh, the set containing only the element one and the set containing the element two, three, as well as all that is implied by these two sets for the access structure. And uh, uh, the complement of the set one is the set two, three. So that's in the complement access structure. And the complement of two, three is one. So that is in the access structure. Um, is everybody following up to now? Or? OK. So uh, also, we, we, we look at secret sharing more as an inform. Here we define secret sharing not as a protocol between dealers and uh, uh, a player and a dealer, but we look at is an, an information theoretic primitive. Where we first we have an access structure, a domain, and uh, and there's two algorithms: the share and reconstruct. So the share algorithm takes a secret and divides it into share, such that uh, if you have the share, if you have an uh, an authorized set of shares, then you're able to reconstruct the secret. If you're not, you're unable to do so. To, and you're not able to gain any information of the secret. And also we'll define as uh, that shares are consistent if, if, if you take any set of shares, they're going to reconstruct to the same secret. So here we, de def we define what our generalized oblivious transfer uh, primitive is. So we have some sets of messages that you're allowed to extract and others that you're not allowed to. Uh, for example, for one out of two OT, you're allowed to extract sets of one, you can either extract the first message and this, or the second message, but you're not allowed to extract the first and the second message. And uh, this is as general as you can go with generalized abbreviated transfer. So uh, this, the input is just, well, the sender has to choose messages and uh, the receiver chooses which message he wants to learn. And if he wants to learn an authorized set, he's able to extract all the messages. Otherwise, uh, the protocol will, the functionality outputs an abort. Um, so how are we going to implement a uh, generalized oblivious transfer? Well, uh, first, we're gonna ch the sender is going to choose a secret. And he's going to share that secret using an appropriate access structure. And then uh, for each message, an, you'll execute an OT. Sender and receiver will execute an OT, where either the, sen the receiver learns a share or he learns a message. And, and uh, if, the, if the receiver is honest and he chooses a valid set of messages, well, he's going to be able to recover the secret. And he can then send the secret back to the sender and the sender is going to be like, yes, you acted honestly because you gave me the secret. And then he's going to kind of reveal, uh, he's going to reveal the information that's needed to, uh, to, to learn the messages. So um, uh, I missed this part, but in the, uh, you're not going to actually send the messages. You're going to send an encrypted version of the message in the OT and the share. And that way you're going to be able to uh, extract the messages you want plus the secret. If you don't extract the secret, then you're not, uh, the, the, the sender is not going to give you the one-time pads. Is everybody clear on this at that point? So the messages are using pad that put inside of the two OT? Yeah, along with the share. Along with the share um, to a secret. And then if you're able to, and then so the receiver chooses uh, what it wants. So in the one of the two OT, you put, Two messages, mm -hmm. each one with its share, or you put... Uh, no, no, you put a, either a message, you either, the, the receiver either extracts a message or a share. So if he extracts a share, he, he, he's closer to extracting the secret, and if he extracts a message, well, he gets the message. If, he's, if he tries to get an unauthorized message, well, he, he, if he gets a set of messages that are not authorized, he's not able to reconstruct the secret, and uh, the guy won't give it, allow him to extract the messages. So formally, this is the protocol. It's not, it's still incorrect, but we're, it gets closer. So 
it's, it's simple. We choose random pads. We encrypt, uh, the sender encrypts the messages using the one-time pads. He, he selects a, a random secret and then shares it. And the receiver just chooses which messages he wants to learn. And then they execute an OT with uh, the encrypted messages, uh, the shares, and the uh, BI is which, the, does he want to learn the message or the share, and tries to reconstruct the secret. He then sends the secret along. If the secret is not the right one, well, he aborts. And the important thing to hear is that if he chooses an unauthorized message, well, he's not going to be able to reconstruct the secret. And then he just sends the one-time pads, and uh, using the, the encrypted messages that he received, he can, he can get those messages. I'll go up to now, or is that clear? Takes a little while to adjust. Okay. Should I move forward? Okay. Um, it's the protocol has it though has a fatal flaw. Well, look. At, let's look at what the security proof is. So the security proof uh, uh, for this is that the sender privacy is, is uh, protected because he has to extract the secret. And to extract the secret, he has, to be, he has to act honestly. And the receiver privacy, well, the OTs don't reveal anything about the receiver's input. Unfortunately, this is not complete because there's a small flaw. And the flaw, well, there's a big flaw, sorry, very big flaw, is that you can corrupt the shares here. And when you execute, when he, chooses to reconstruct the secret the receiver. So the sender is cheating, and he wants to learn what the set of messages that the receiver learned. And what he's going to do is he's going to corrupt the shares, and he's going to reconstruct the secret. But what he's going to reconstruct is a, it now becomes a function of which messages he chooses, and this allows the sender to learn what messages uh, the receiver learned. And uh, yeah. so. So this allows him to break the protocol. So now, how do we fix it? Well, the main problem here is that the shares can be inconsistent. So what we want to ensure is that the shares are consistent. So the, the basic idea is to replace the OT with a verifiable OT. And instead of sending the secrets directly, he, he commits to it. And then he, the sender can reveal his shares the shares that he used because of the properties of the verifiable oblivious transfer. And then he can check that the shares are consistent. If they're inconsistent, they abort. And since he's committed to it, only committed to it, uh, these, the sender can't learn any information about it. But then to make sure that the sender actually chose valid shares, we open the commitment and the sender can now make sure that the, uh, the receiver acted honestly. Yes? No, no. Uh, okay, so the rec uh, so for the verifiable OT, it's it seems it's like an ordinary OT, except that the sender is committed to his in addition, he's committed to the inputs. So so then you can reveal your inputs that you gave the the oblivious transfer. Just opening the commitment. Yeah, you can open the commitment, but it's the sender who chooses to when, if he wants to. Yeah. And here you're saying you're going to send away, send along all the shares. Uh, yeah, you're going to reveal all the shares, and the, the reason why is you want to make sure that he's actually shit, that you're always going to reconstruct the same secret. Yeah. And so, um, so this allows you to do GOT. So. The only thing now is you have to come up with access structures. So uh, before we had a we we had a protocol that wasn't secure, but they had argued security. So we want to go a little bit uh, stronger. So uh, we use the universal composability framework to show its security, and uh, what that essentially entails 
I think I should go less into detail maybe of, about it. But what it entails is that you have a real world and an ideal world where the simulator is kind of controlling it and you, who only uses the actual functionality and you want to pretend that he wants to pretend that, he's, that it's the real world. And you, want, you make it so that it's undistinguishable. Um, this, uh, yeah. um, it's a bit complicated, but uh, essentially what we're doing is just a simulation of, a, of a, the protocol and using only the ideal functionality. This, yeah. So here, um, when we're saying we're doing the sender car simulation, we're we're doing that. There's the environment, there's the simulator, and then there's the actual protocol, and we want to pretend that we want to make it so that they're undistinguishable. Um, so, um, uh, uh, are you guys familiar with simulation-based security? Okay, so so this is basically a. a, a in short, it's basically a simulation to, so that you, 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 the real protocol and the ideal protocol is, uh, look exactly the same. And the recipient is corrupt? No, the sender is corrupt. Yeah, the sender is corrupt. So, so the environment is, is trying to cheat. And so the simulator just looks. And if he sees anything inconsistent, he, he just aborts. That's basically what he has to do. And uh, then he can extract the messages and just interact with the ideal functionality, and that's going to be the solution. Um, here, it's it's the receiver that's corrupted, and we're trying to simulate that. And uh, it's uh, uh, the so it's just simulating what the protocol would look like. And the only flaw in this is that if he guesses s, if he tries to cheat and guesses s correctly. Well, that, then that's the only case where the simulation really fails. But that happens only with exponentially small probability. OK, so, um, so we, we, we showed how GOT, we can do GOT. So what are the applications of generalized oblivious transfer? So first of all, um, k out of not then this becomes easy, very easy to do because uh, the complement of the access structure associated to uh, n minus k out of n secret sharing uh, is exactly the set of messages authorized by a k out of n ot. So you, you execute n o verifiable ots and you can do any k out of n ot. Sorry. Uh, so another uh, uh, application of generalized oblivious transfer is something called batch single choice cut and choose OT. And this is a, a, a very strong type of, uh, so you have an N by S matrix of pairs of values. So uh, just to make it, I'll write an example here. You have uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, and G, H. And uh, there's a, uh, so there's a, uh, and the uh, receiver, he can learn for, for each row, either the first one or the second one of each in the row. And then uh, he can also learn both values in half the columns. Uh, so for example, if I have this, if I choose to learn, if the receiver chooses to learn to this column and for uh, this row, he chooses zero. And for this row, he chooses one. Well, the values he's going to get is A, uh, C, D. And for this one, he's going to get F and G, H. And the first element of the pair. And then he's going to get uh, both of these values. And he's also going to get both of these values because he chose to learn this column, both values. And for this one, he's going to get uh, f because it's the first one, uh, the second one. And then he's going to choose, he's going to learn both because he chose this column to learn. Seems like 
unusual. Are there <coughs> applications to this that can't be achieved easily with normal hmm? are, are there some applications to this particular variant that yes. are beyond normal OT? Uh, yes. Um, so I'm going to. So, uh, so, well, uh, in short, there's a way to, uh, to define a secret sharing that uses the right access structure for this one that actually only uses uh, uh, twice the size of the, of the... So you, you, you have uh, two secret sharing schemes that I'm going to use and like combine them together to give you an access structure. And uh, then there's an application... Uh, so. Um, we're going to have an okay I'm okay yeah so uh, um, so there's going to be two basic secret sharings that you're going to combine together the first one is going to ensure that you you learn only the first or the second value for each row and this is basically you you uh, you have a l out of l secret sharing and then you divide it again each share into shares so that you can make sure that you learn only one value per each r row. And then you're going to use, uh, uh, you're going to ensure that you're going, only going to learn the both inputs for half the columns. And that's their secret sharing. And you're going to combine them, their shares together by concatenating them. And this is going to allow you to do a batch single choice cut and choose OT. Okay, what are the applications of this uh, particular uh, uh, cutting version of OT or generalized? Well, they have to do with uh, Yao's garbled circuit. So, so uh, it's in the cut and choose paradigm. So usually in the cut and choose paradigm, what you're going to do is you're going to, uh, there's going to be half the circuits that are going to be checked for consistency so you know that they're right. And then you're going to evaluate half of them. And the big problem is that you have to do basic three things. You have to check the circuits. You have to make sure that the, uh, the first player uses consistent input and the second one consist uses consistent input. But what batch single choice cut and choose OT is allows you to do two of the three things. It allows you to, uh, it forces P1s to send consistent circuits because these are basically, uh, you can think of these as the first, the second player's inputs. So you can either learn uh, the first zero, the, the zero value or the one value. And this is kind of forcing him to, to use consistent inputs. And the other one, the columns, is f to check the consistency of circuits where he gets both keys for the circuit. So this allows you to make sure that the, the circuits are consistent and that the second player always uses this is the same input. And what's missing is that, um, is that you, you want to make sure that the first player's input are consistent. But you can use combination of bit commitments and uh, bit commitment with XOR to do that. OK. Um, is that clear up to now? Yes, exactly. The, they're, they're batch single choice kind of choose. Yeah, OT protocol. But they're they depending on a very specific computational assumption, while we have a very black box primitive for doing it. Uh, was anyone at crypto here? Okay, so do you rem um, okay, so uh, do you remember the multi? Did they actually use it? Okay, no, that. Okay, so the multi sender K out of N O T is another primitive. So uh, every sender uh, inputs a vector of n strings. And then uh, the receiver inputs a set of indices of size exactly k. And so here, you, each, each, each uh, uh, so the receiver basically chooses the same, uh, the same. So if we think of every player's input as a row in a matrix, well, the receiver is going to choose certain columns and extract those columns. Hmm? Uh, yeah, it's one of the parameters. So, so it's multi sender k out of not. So it's a parameter. Yeah. Uh, does every um, so? 
Yes. He, if he said is a, I don't know, one and two, then he gets the first message for everybody and the second message for everybody? Or the second message for everybody, yeah. Uh, can I have a, where's the eraser? So here, uh, for example, if the input from the sender is 0, 1, and uh, the second one is 1, 0, well, he can either choose this one, and he'll learn 0, 1, or he can choose, uh, or he can choose this one, and he'll learn 1, 0. Okay. But there's many senders, so, so it's, it's a bit different than generalizability is transfer. Well, uh, so how do we implement this functionality? Well, um, first of all, we first think of it as a GOT. So it's a very simple GOT where you, you basically have a GOT where you have a, a, a matrix and you just say that you're going to extract the columns. And you, you kind of look at the shares like they are. But that's a single sender and a single receiver. So um, now you want to extend that to many senders and just one receiver. So um, is this a clear, how the secret sharing that it's just linear? You, you divide the shares. Each share has a row. And then you div take each share and then divide in, in take each share and reshare it use for each column. OK. Uh, yeah, so so this uh, you you can see that you, you you the GOT version is correct. So now we have to take this protocol which only has one player, and you 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 make it so that there's many senders instead of just one. But so the way uh, we do it is each sender generates the share as in the GOT version of it, and then what we're we're instead of using a, any. Per, secret sharing, we're going to use linear secret sharing. And then what we're going to do is we're going to take uh, each player is going to have a row associated to them. So everybody is going to give them their row. And then they're going to add up those rows. And if they reconstruct all the rows, the sender should be, uh, the receiver should be able to extract the, sh the sum of the secrets. So if each player selects a secret, then uh, by combining these shares, the resulting secret will be the sum of the secret. So this is, how, this is like the share combination. And so uh, to get the actual multi-sender k out of NOT protocol, what we do is we, we, we combine the shares together, and then each person uh, uses those shares to do like a k out of NOT for GOT using those shares. And then uh, they're also going to commit to their secrets. And at the end, what the sender should reveal, what the receiver should reveal is the sum of the secrets. And then they're, they're going to decommit to their secrets. And we're going to verify that that's correct. Also, there's the things that you still have to check the consistency of shares and, and all of that. But uh, it all comes together. Yeah. So it's the same access structure as the GOT version, but instead you've got many secrets that have been combined into one. And the senders have to uh, commit to their secret and then reveal it so that s certain senders can't just change their uh, secret so that it appears that like he recovered the right secret when he didn't. But the nice thing is that then uh, each, each sender only has to use n VOTs with the receiver, and the receiver only, he has to do n squared uh, verifiable Ts, but he, the, he only ha each sender only has to do n verifiable Ts. But the, share, uh, the sharing cost is quadratic, though, in the number of players. Uh, so um, uh, the applications of the multi-sender K out of NOT are relating to uh, uh, the IPS compiler. And the IPS compiler is that you have an inner protocol and an outer protocol, 
where you have like a, in the inner protocol you have real players, and in the outer protocol you have a, a honest a, a protocol for honest uh, majority, a protocol that succeeds if you have honest majority, and uh, if you try to cheat, uh, what you have to do is corrupt at least the majority of the outer protocol. But in IPS compiler, you have a watch list where you're kind of spying on certain players. And if you want to corrupt them, and if you detect any cheating, you abort. So in this compiler, the, there's a watch list where you're spying on people. And then if you want to cheat, you have to corrupt at least the majority. But if you're corrupting at least the majority, well, if somebody's sp spying on many, uh, on spying on some of the uh, virtual parties, then you'll be able to detect that they're cheating. So, um, so the multi-sender K out of NOT protocol was an important primitive to actually optimize it. It's uh, it's in the article. So, uh, it's a cheap way to spy on on the virtual parties. Um, so, something that's probably easier than what I've shown you is price oblivious transfer. So, uh, price oblivious transfer is imagine you want to uh, you want to buy a movie but you don't want to tell them which movie you want to buy. And, or you want to buy many movies. And then each movie has a certain cost. And you pay a certain amount, like $30, and you say, OK, I'm going to buy movies for $30 worth. And then you say, OK, uh, we're going to interact so that you buy those movies, but I don't know which movies you bought. And I'm assured that you're not going to buy more than $30 worth of movies. So, so, so. So the solution is that we're going to use weighted secret sharing, where each share has a weight w, wi, so, and a set is authorized if and only if the weight of those is greater than equal than, than a certain number. So the trick here is just say, OK, um, if you bought, so the share is going to be the, so, so to extract the secret, you're going to just say that um, each share each movie is going to have a sh share associated to it that has the right price, that has its price as its weight. And if you want to get more than the price, well, you're not going to be able to extract the secret. Is there an instantiation of weighted secret sharing that's more efficient than just giving WI shares? Okay, to I, uh, I, I'm, I, I don't know, honestly. Yeah, which is actually one of my... Uh, uh, Questions. So, uh, so here we've shown a couple of applications of uh, of generalized oblivious transfer, and that can be instantiated for verifiable OT. So we have K out of N O T, which naturally is just a simple generalization. We have batch single choice cut and choose OT, which is very useful for secure function evaluation, and we have the multi sender K out of o N O T protocol, which was useful for the I P S compiler, its optimization. And we also have price oblivious transfer. And we think there are many more, but uh, I haven't been clever enough to s see more for, for, for now. <laughs> I'm still looking. Um, and uh, f future questions are, uh, well, what are more GOT applications? Is there more efficient things? we could, Can we do more protocols more efficiently with it, uh, which is the optimization? Also, a missing part is, We'd like to show that a lot of different primitives, can, uh, a lot of computational primitives can be used to implement verifiable OT, and we'd like it to be uh, secure in the universal composability framework. And uh, also, the last one is how efficiently can we implement different uh, generalized oblivious transfers, which has something to do with an access structure, with their access structure. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, that concludes my presentation. Um, since you're talking about efficiency, I have to admit, I, I bristle a little bit whenever I see people talk about uh, M out of M uh, secret sharing or L out of L secret sharing, because you don't have to do it. You know, secret sharing is, is too powerful a tool for that, right? You can share by just you know, creating a bunch of values whose, whose XOR is the secret. Right. And you don't have to go through all the, the secret sharing mechanism. Uh, well. For the batch single choice cut and choose OT, you had to have, uh, it was a bit complicated because you had to have learn uh, 
half the column half the columns you learn both values and yet you have to also learn only you only should be able to learn for those for those that are not in the columns you should only learn uh, one that are not values so sometimes it's more complicated yeah I mean, uh, so it was used as a component in some cases yeah. so in those cases you don't need to bother with polynomials at all just do it much more simple Yeah. Um, so the construction we get here is black box construction. Yes. But so, do you have any sense if you actually wanted to instantiate with concrete sort of constructions, you still have any sense of what the most efficient um, instantiation would be based on the assumption? I, I think it would just depend on the. I think all you all you need to do is look how cheaply how cheap is verifiable oblivious transfer, and I I was saying that. Um, uh, uh, the, some are, uh, it's getting to be like, uh, I don't know, something, um, I think there's a lot of protocols for universal composable OT, uh, string OT, and they require like uh, 20 exponentiations, something like that. And I think uh, if you take most OT protocols and try to transform it into verifiable OT, I think there's a lot of room that you can do that very simply because a lot of them, as they said, follow the paradigm where you commit to your messages and then the, the, the receiver sends a ciphertext and then the sender, um, maybe I should go back to the example because I actually use something more general, but um, uh, an easy way to do homomorphic encryption is using uh, is using uh, an, an easy way to implement. Uh, a lot of people use uh, homomorphic encryption to to implement OT, and so w why? Um, so I think I'll use the board. So why uh, homomorphic encryption is useful is because uh, if you encrypt x zero, and if you encrypt x one and you send it to the receiver, uh, receiver, well, the receiver, what he can do is, uh, what he can do is he can calculate a C, uh, and he can then encrypt, uh, uh, he can then encrypt C, and encrypt whichever message he wants to learn with it, and this will be, give him the encryption of C plus XB, right? And, uh, and so there, there's still a proof of knowledge to show that he actually did that, but then all he has to do is then send, uh, we'll call this C prime. He sends C prime, and then uh, he, he'll send the decryption of C prime, and this will allow him to, uh, to just, he, he just, he, he just subtract, he, he learns, so we'll call this uh, M prime, and he just does M prime minus C, and he gets uh, X B. This is a lot like blinding. Hmm? This is pretty much blinding. Yeah, exactly, so it's blinding. So if you want to transform this to a VOT, well, all you have to do is take this, and decrypt this, and that reveals x0. So it's, a, it, it, it's another thing to show its security, but it's a very simple way of getting verifiable OT conceptually. And uh, that's why I think verifiable OT is, is, is a very sound primitive. Should, Um, uh, well, um, there's, um, uh, if, okay, so I've, um, uh, do you know, um, bilinear, okay, so there's, there's certain homomorphic encryption, uh, homomorphic commitments. And I think that uh, if you combine generalized oblivious transfer 
and they somehow rely on homomorphic encryptions, uh, homomorphic, uh, actually, perhaps you can also use the homomorphic properties, for example, because of the, the plain text to do other things like that. So yeah, there's possibly extensions, but I'm not sure how. Oh, okay, I was thinking of another thing, is that, uh, um, so in batch single choice OT, for example, uh, they've actually got optimizations where they use, uh, instead of just doing one at a time, uh, the, the, the uh, OTs, they kind of do them in parallel and they use exponentially, instead of one exponentiation, they can do many very cheaply rather than just doing one of them at the same time. So in that sense, there's, there's optimizations that can be done. No, no, but in general, maybe okay. for general oblivious transfer, if you have verifiable OTs and then you, you can somehow combine them and do them more efficiently than just doing them independently. Thank you for having me at the Microsoft Features. It's been a pleasure.